Rogues Gallery Uncovered. Bad behaviour in period costume. A non-judgmental shuffle into the scandalous lives of history's greatest libertines, Lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains adult themes, sexual references, breakfast cereal abuse and extremely cold showers. There's also a lot of wanking in it. Stop it or you'll go blind and feeble and mad and then you'll die. Keeping your hands to yourself with the mid-19th century's most terrifying social contagion. Masturbating. Once again, it's been slightly longer than I'd hoped between episodes, I'm afraid. This wasn't down to indolence on my part. In fact, quite the opposite. Since the last time we spoke, I've been to the Middle East to write about history and all the way to London to perform the part of a large Teutonic man wearing very small swimming trunks. Suffice it to say, I've been a bit busier than normal. Of course, the recent coronation was also a little bit of a distraction. We had a street party round our way, which was the perfect opportunity for me to get patriotically hammered with all of the neighbours that I hardly speak to for 99% of the time. God save the King. It also inspired me to start work on an episode about King Edward VII, Dirty Bertie, but that's for later. Quick shout out to some lovable rogues who got in touch at simon at roguesgalleryonline.com, addresses in the show notes, Firstly, to Melissa, a university student from, I think, the UK, who's not only a fan of the podcast, but is also using Fanny Murray, the subject of a previous episode, as part of one of her research papers. It was lovely to talk harlots with you, Melissa. Also, Mike from Location Unknown. He answered my request for non-European rogues with, by his own admission, a little bit of a curveball. Musical legend Ray Charles. Mike describes Ray Charles as, and I'm quoting... A drug user, a womanizer, but also roguish in good ways. Highly innovative in his music, stood up for civil rights in 1960s Georgia. Well, you had me at womanizer, Mike, so Ray's definitely on the list. Also, not forgetting Facebook rogues, Simon Wallace and Nicholas Sanders. Now, this next episode is a little bit of a departure, in that it doesn't focus on one particular roguish character or group of characters, but rather it looks at how one intimate act which I suppose can be roguish, depending on when and where you do it, was the subject of a 19th century Operation Fear, which tried to terrify people into a pattern of prescribed behaviour, even though its narrative was patently ridiculous. You could look for modern equivalents of that if you like, but I'm staying out of it. And on that brave note, the following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set and as such may contain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists and their times which would today be considered unacceptable. As I'm not a rabidly anti-masturbation 19th century religious zealot, in fact I'm very very pro and who's to say I'm not doing it right now? Those attitudes and opinions are obviously not mine. I'm not really doing it. Honestly. England, 1867. This is a public information lecture. Masturbation can kill. Do not do it. The blasphemous evil of self-pollution has in its insidious power the capacity to debase the moral and psychological backbone of an entire generation rendering the flower of great British manhood a collection of dribbling incontinent half-wits by the 1880s. For the sake of the empire, refrain from masturbation. This perverted inclination has been scientifically proven to cause loss of appetite, indigestion, headache, vertigo, tinnitus, rigors, flushings, constant clamminess of the hands, want of sleep, congestion, chronic inflammation of the brain, apoplectic symptoms, palpitation of the heart, emaciation, palsy and insanity. And that is but an abridged list supplied by Queen Victoria's own personal physician, Dr. William Mackenzie. For the sake of your life and your immortal soul, refrain from masturbation. 
Listen to this heart-rending tale of onanistic downfall based on the writings of renowned French man of science Samuel Auguste Tissot. Written in 1830, it's just as terrifying and factually accurate today. Look at this young man, just 17 years of age, proud of bearing, clear of eye, the pride of his dear sweet mother, destined for a life in the clergy perhaps, or the armed forces. We will never know why he took to masturbation. Perhaps he was encouraged by filthy boys at his boarding school or accidentally stumbled across some lewd woodcuts in a poacher's hut. Whatever the reason, you can observe how quickly his crime has led to his corruption. See how old he looks before his time, his back hunched like a geriatric. But he continues with his solitary vice and a devouring fire burns up his entrails and he suffers from horrible stomach pains. Look at his eyes. Once so pure, so brilliant, their gleam is gone. Now a band of fire surrounds them. But still he masturbates and now he can no longer walk. His legs have given way. At night, dreadful dreams disturb his rest. He cannot sleep. Would now that he could leave himself alone, but this unholy aberration has him in its grasp and his teeth become rotten and fall out. What's worse, his chest is burning and he begins coughing up blood. His hair, once so beautiful, is falling out. Early in life, he's becoming that most pitiful of conditions. Bald. So hungry, so very, very hungry, he wants to eat, but no food will stay within his stomach. Helpless, in a whirlwind of masturbation, his chest begins to buckle and he vomits blood. His entire body becomes covered with pustules. A horrible, horrible sight. Even if he could stop touching himself now, it would be too late. A slow fever consumes him and he languishes, his entire body burning up. The end is near, his body is becoming completely stiff, his limbs stop moving. He raves and raves and raves, stiffening in anticipation of coming death. At the age of Joe, at the age of just 17, only months after starting the loathsome habit of masturbation, he expires in horrible torments. Onanism, the facts. The sin of onanism is named after Onan, who, in the book of Genesis, refused to impregnate his brother's widow and instead spilled his seed upon the floor. For committing this act, an all-loving and forgiving God violently struck him down, and mankind learned that doing anything else with semen, apart from the begatting of children, was the most heinous of crimes. A so-called scholar of my acquaintance says that the ancient Sumerian, Greek, Roman and Egyptian cultures regarded masturbation as both natural and healthy for thousands of years. But they of course were godless heathens who have contributed nothing to the modern world. God says no to masturbating. Far better to listen to the words of one of Great Britain's most respected gynaecologists, Dr William Acton, the author of the functions and disorders of the reproductive organs in childhood, youth, adult age and advanced life. He maintains that all men have a finite amount of energy and the expenditure of it through self-manipulation results in both physical and mental degeneracy. Reasons for this he says are manifold, beginning usually in childhood from hereditary predisposition, irritations of the rectum arising from worms, bedwetting and washing the penis too vigorously. Although not a supporter of circumcision, he does argue that the foreskin is another surface for the excitement of the reflex action, so make of that what you will, and that flogging on the buttocks at school, widely considered a character building experience, can occasionally lead to beastly inclinations. On the subject of youth, while young men who engage in vigorous, healthy outdoor pursuits to the point of exhaustion, and often bookended by cold baths, rarely feel the need to engage in the solitary vice, those who allow themselves to be more intellectually stimulated are at much greater risk. Acton refers to these fellows as puny exotics whose intellectual education has been fostered at the expense of their physical development and advises them to refrain from studying the classical works which are almost certain to excite sexual feelings. Excessive thinking leads to lewdness. Do not do it. The American Sylvester Graham tells us that the loss of an ounce of semen is equivalent to losing an ounce of blood and urges even married couples to have intercourse no more than once a month. 
Those who masturbate, he says, are shy, suspicious, languid, unconcerned with hygiene and jaundiced. They grow up, he warns, with a body full of disease and with a mind in ruins, the loathsome habit still tyrannising over them with the inexorable imperiousness of a fiend of darkness. Ulcerous sores, in some cases, break out upon the head, breast, back and thighs, and these sometimes enlarge into permanent fistulas of a cancerous character and continue, perhaps for years, to discharge great quantities of fetid, loathsome pus and not infrequently terminate in death. Graham suggests that rich and flavourful diets, particularly those involving spicy food, can contribute to inflaming lascivious behaviour, and to that end has developed a special cracker of unsurpassed blandness in taste and texture to distract from thoughts of sex whilst at the dinner table. Do not eat your way into purgatory. For those warriors in the battle against masturbation who wish to arm themselves and take on this enemy hand to hand, science has manufactured an array of ingenious weapons. The four-pointed urethral ring, when placed around the flaccid penis, will ensure that involuntary and even nocturnal tumescence is painfully discouraged. The bow suggests that it could also be given as a Christmas gift or as a reward for the passing of one's exams. This male chastity device encases the misbehaving member in an armoured carapace, making erection impossible and manipulation only an option with the aid of a qualified locksmith. A variety of other devices, some based on bear traps, others with a complex system of bells attached, can both prevent nocturnal emissions, spermatorrhea, or alert a watchful household that such an event is about to take place. Self-purity through science. No touching. But what of the female? Self-abuse among women is rare, an observation expertly explained by Dr Acton, who says, I should say that the majority of women, happily for them, are not very much troubled with sexual feeling of any kind. As a general rule, a modest woman seldom desires any sexual gratification for herself. She submits to her husband's embraces, but principally to gratify him, and were it not for the desire of maternity, would rather be relieved from his attentions. Those women who seek out and enjoy sexual pleasure are undoubtedly suffering from a malady of the brain known as nymphomania and, if conventional treatments prove unsuccessful, should be institutionalised. Female hysteria, however, is a condition that affects at least a quarter of all women and has absolutely no link to sexual feelings whatsoever. The ministrations of a small but dedicated group of physicians to alleviate this condition by generating an hysterical paroxysm using therapeutic massage should be roundly supported. Ladies, do not do this. In conclusion, with the exception of blackguards, degenerates and prostitutes, the stimulation of one's genitals is the most vile and repellent act imaginable. However, particularly among the youth, such behaviour should be severely discouraged before it becomes habit-forming and destroys the very fabric of society. It's not an exaggeration to say that masturbation is more dangerous for public health than bubonic plague, cholera, typhoid, smallpox, and syphilis combined. For public morality, its effects are akin to unlocking the kingdom of Satan and literally bringing hell to earth. As you make your way home this evening, consider the words of Dr. Acton, who, when discussing this subject with a clergyman, received this invaluable piece of advice. If a man is tormented by evil thoughts at night, let him be directed to cross his arms upon his breast and extend himself as if he were lying in his coffin. Let him endeavour to think of himself as he will be one day stretched in death. If such solemn thoughts do not drive away evil imaginations, let him rise from his bed and lie upon the floor. Better indeed to welcome death's sweet embrace than to succumb to the evil of masturbation. For those who do not feel they can trust their moral fortitude, stiff leather sleep gauntlets are available at the door. Thank you. Stop it. To a 21st century mind, the Victorian terror of me time is totally ridiculous, although I suspect that many of its strictest fear mongers snuck off for a guilt-laden hypocritical tug more often than they'd ever care to admit. 
As to where it all came from, well, not surprisingly, religion had an awful lot to answer for, but I rummaged around to find some more specific anti-wanking literature and came across, pun intended, a pioneering work from 1712. It's the wonderfully named Onania, or The Hideous Sin of Self-Pollution and All Its Frightful Consequences, by our old friend Samuel Tiso. Now, he was actually a Swiss physician who specialised in conditions of the mind and, based on no evidence whatsoever, wrote several works in the 18th century that blamed masturbation for a raft of unpleasant medical conditions. He wrote, Shall I do the accent? Self-pollution is a cr No, I won't. Self-pollution is a crime, not only against nature, but against society, against God. It corrupts the imagination, weakens the body, and makes men and women mentally, physically, and morally unfit for the duties of life. 100 years later, he was the Anthony Fauci of unreliable masturbation information. His books, though, flew off the shelves. And if you're building your own library of sexual abstinence, consider also getting yourself copies of the following. The Silent Friend, 1848, by Sylvester Graham. He's the bland cracker guy who thought an uninteresting diet would prevent self-love. And the unputdownable Plain Facts for Old and Young, 1881, by John Harvey Kellogg, the legendary breakfast cereal pioneer and passionate anti-masturbator. The story that he invented cornflakes to stop people touching themselves is popular, but a little bit of an urban myth, although he did agree with Graham that exciting and spicy foods led to social degeneracy. When he wasn't tinkering with corn to make it more boring, Kellogg was busy inventing a patented genital cage for men whose urges couldn't be tamed by cereal alone. He was also a big fan of harsh punishments, shaming and fear to make sure that boys in particular stayed on the straight and narrow. And while we're on the subject of toss-preventing gadgetry, my research delvings have revealed more than the usual box full of chastity belts, knob cages and penis rings. If you really couldn't leave yourself alone in the 1800s, it was perfectly acceptable to be confined within a thick canvas straitjacket. Or, if that was considered to be a little heavy-handed, pun again intended, you could have only your arms fastened into a pair of special anti-masturbation sleeves, which prevented any undue fumbling below the waist. Perhaps most wince-inducing are accounts of doctors recommending that habitual masturbators apply caustic ointments, such as cantharidin, which apparently is derived from Spanish fly, to their genitals in order to create painful blisters which would discourage further touching. Ouch. But it wasn't all bad news. As we've established in previous episodes, the Victorians, despite their somewhat prudish image, consumed more than their fair share of saucy imagery and erotic literature, and you know that's only going to lead to one thing. I actually think they were a lot more clued up and free-thinking about sex than we give them credit for. It's just that many were such terrible hypocrites about it. We have to remember that there really were adverts for dildos in the back of, admittedly disreputable, late 19th century magazines. They were marketed as prosthetic penis attachments. And a man who was having erectile issues was supposed to wear one so he could still do the business. A bit like a thick leather sheath. I suspect many, though, were just bought by women for use on their own. Early vibrators were also developed during this period, without the later pretense that they were for curing backache. These were either hand-cranked or, believe it or not, powered by steam. There were also some academics who, while not directly advocating masturbation, did study it and human sexuality in a non-judgmental way. So, hats off to Richard von Kraft Ebing, the Austrian psychoanalyst who coined the phrase psychopathia sexualis. Also, the British doctor Havelock Ellis and Edwardian sexologist Ewan Bloch. My favourite positive take on the subject, however, came from an American preacher called John Humphrey Noyes, who wrote the following. It's obvious that before marriage, men have no lawful method of discharge but masturbation. And after marriage, it is as foolish and cruel to expend one's seeds on a wife, merely for the sake of getting rid of it, as it would be to fire a gun at one's best friend, merely for the sake of unloading it. If a blunderbuss must be emptied, 
and the charge cannot be drawn, it is better to fire into the air than to kill somebody with it. Finally, there were a few examples of satirists who knew that the puritanical, ill-informed and hysterical mastophia was a subject worth lampooning, such as the writer of an 1836 advert for Dr. Prostate's Anti-Onanistic Nose Clips, which appeared in a satirical publication called The Comic Annual, and 1848's The Naughty Boys Illustrated Portfolio, a mickey-taking illustrated booklet in which various mischievous schoolboys are caught having a quick one in a variety of ridiculous situations. Thank goodness for satirists. And wankers. Next time on Rogue's Gallery Uncovered. Dirty Bertie Does Paris. I told you I was inspired. Parisian brothels by royal appointment with Victorian England's randiest royal, King Edward VII. I hope you don't mind the occasionally extended gaps between episodes. Apparently, it goes against all the rules of podcasting scheduling. But then this podcast is about rule breakers, so it does kind of make sense. My only excuses are work commitments and a determination not to spend every hour of the day hunkered over a reference book, a PC or a microphone, however much fun that might often be, so I can go out and have a few roguish adventures of my own. If you have any suggestions of rogues that you'd like me to feature or roguish practices that you'd like me to explore, leave yourself alone and get in touch by emailing simon at roguesgalleryonline.com. The address is in the show notes. And if you want to sign up to my newsletter and become a lovable rogue, as many of you are doing, which is brilliant, feel free to peruse my website, roguesgalleryuncovered.com, where you can do exactly that and enjoy some roguish imagery and shop at the merch store and kit yourself out like a proper roguish dandy. The link, it's you know where. Anyway, have a great fortnight, stay roguish, and I'll see you yesterday. <laughs>